the loss of man hours in factories. Have any of them ever worked in a factory? You don't have to work in a factory. Lots of people do, Bryce. You don't work in a factory if you don't have to. But how can you be an expert on factories if you spent your whole life working in one? Workers' compensation Anyone cases are very delicate. They often concern people who are the victims of modern in. industrial society. Now you're being completely irrational. Sometimes crippled and broken people. people. People who have been snapped on the wheel of increased production. The investigation of these cases must be handled with the greatest sensitivity and respect for the human equation. Here we go. Use the Polaroid. Use the Polaroid. Not the bastard. Where's the other I film? The land's gonna we got another film for this? We got another film? No, don't worry about it. I've got all on this. Probably 20 shots. Motor drive, son. Pure magic. Yeah, I know. I used it on the weekend. You used this? What for? Tracy's birthday. Now, I thought we discussed that, that this camera was to be used for work only, not for personal use. Did you use all the film? Not sure. Well, I hope you put high-speed film back in the camera. If you didn't, all the, all the exposures will be up the spout. Did you? Did you put high-speed film back in the camera? Well, I can't remember, for heaven's sake. God, I hope you didn't put slow-speed film in. What did you put in it? Not all that much, really. You're kidding. You've got to be, Ken. You're not, are you? You idiot. So, we have on the very expensive motor drive camera no photos preserved for posterity on no film. Our entire case now rests on the single Polaroid shot taken by you. Where is it? Give it to me. Give it to me. Am I right in assuming that this is a photo of my left ear? Hey, was he five bucks, mate? and explain yeah all right tell them we didn't get any shots of the man who's suing them for a hundred grand doing a decathlon in bray street but we got some rather lovely snaps of your daughter's birthday party why don't we just tell them that the guy's permanently physically incapacitated ah but he's not is he he's a liar he is robbing them look we represent the insurance company they're the bloody robbers they rob you all your working life and when you want the money back they rob someone else rob the interest off the top of it, and then hire a couple of dongers like us to help them. You're twisted, Ken. A lot of ignorant people are. You really have no respect for the law, do you, Ken? You're bloody near a criminal, Ken. You know as well as I do that that, that car was parked just a little too close to the fire hydrant. Hello there. Bryce, I'd like you to meet Jean Fitzgerald. Jean, this is Bryce, who's our... Um... Director of Operations. How do you do? How do you do? And this is Ken, one of our field operators. How G'day, Jean. Do? Jean's with the university. Ah, I thought your face was familiar. I'm the private secretary to the head of the English department, Professor Ian Daniels. Uh, yes, of course. Actually, I do remember him. He speaks very highly of you, Bryce. He wants to arrange a meeting with you. Why didn't he uh, bring us up to arrange a meeting with us himself? Well, he's worried about security. I can understand that. Attention. Pat, please be quiet. Um, has Professor Daniels any suitable suggestions for a meeting place? Uh, Pat, I'll handle this. Has some suitable meeting place been suggested? By Professor Daniels? I was to establish a time and a place with you. And what if that doesn't suit Professor Daniels? Well, I'm going to ring him to confirm. Using the phone. What else, Ken? Which he wasn't prepared to use to ring us to arrange a meeting, which is why Gene's here, and he's going to ring back and confirm using the phone which he's not prepared to use. Is this guy allowed out at night? 
course. I knew that David had never set foot inside Oxford, so I was prepared to let him dig his own grave. <laughs> and what did Gilby say? And, excuse me. Hello. Oh. Yes. Yes, hang on a minute. Look, I, I can't talk right now. Hang on a minute. Excuse me, Dennis. Would you mind if we continue this when I'm through here? Uh, of course. Of course. I'm sorry, I wasn't alone. Bryce, is it? Ian's busy, Travis. Something's on. Look, I can't emphasize enough the need for secrecy in this matter. But why don't we have a chin wag over some lunch? I know a quaint little out-of-the-way Italian dive called Peppino's. But might I suggest that our appointmento take place fiori? No, outside. El fresco. No, that our meeting should take place outside. Well, outside this quaint little Italian dive called Peppino's. Fine, I understand. Yeah. That's it. Tomorrow, meeting. Daniels, Ken and I to wear something floral. Pat, bring her into garden. Flower on the lapel, floral tie, use your imagination. Don't have one. Why don't you just meet him inside the restaurant? Security, Pat. Secrecy is a key element here. You can't be too careful, Pat. The Bosch are everywhere. Don't be silly, Ken. You can see the position I'm in, of course. Absolutely. Not really, no. I don't envy you. Nor do I, because that's the position he's in. Look, I have the highest pass rate of any tertiary institution in the country. Good day, Ian. <laughs> well, there, there are courses in human relations that have a lower pass rate than I do. You don't want people to pass? Not in the numbers they have been. We've lost control. Up until a few years ago, our failure rate was so well worked out that we knew by the end of first term what was going to happen in November. <laughs> Can't you fail more? Would that I could, Bryce. The trouble is, the general standard of students' exam paper is too good. Well, couldn't you set more difficult papers, perhaps? The essay questions would stump a PhD student. My last practical criticism had most of the text in Latin, and more than half my second-year students pointed out an error in the translation. Have the scolopini, Ian, it's marvellous. <laughs> right. <laughs> is there a chance, no matter how remote, let's fly a kite here, that the exam questions are being leaked? Well, obviously. Look, I have been right through the education system in this country. I've served on commissions, I've generated improvement schemes, I've chaired government inquiries. More than anyone else, I have been responsible for the development of the tertiary curriculum in Australia. Good day. And, good day. And I can say with confidence that the standard of the students has steadily dropped away. There is not a chance that more than a certain percentage of the students who go through our infrastructure of the school system could possibly pass my department's exams. But they are. Are they? Obviously, a lot of very important discussion goes on in universities and colleges of higher education, or there'd be no one splitting atoms or analysing the disastrous effects of splitting atoms. But, like the conversation in many other jobs, a lot of it is the sort that makes you wonder whether or not you've left the gas on. I can't see beads and getting up. They haven't got the numbers. I wouldn't rely on that. Travis has been doing a job on Daniels. You know they both support Carlton. Oh, Jesus, so does Palin. All our Marxists support Carlton. It's a bloody conspiracy. No, this is the editorship of meaning and text. They're going to be pulling out all the stops. We ought to be fielding our own candidate. Who? Alford? Oh, too old. Bunbury. Sydney Bush, too unreliable. They'll be turning the thing into a bloody personal contacts magazine. No, it has to be someone local. Well, I can't think of anyone. Nor can I. But I am not going to tolerate some bloody Marxist running the principal intellectual organ of the entire university. I'm really not happy with this idea, Brass. There's such a wonderful feeling of uh, fellowship and trust in the department at the moment that uh, I would hate to compromise that in any way. We wouldn't jeopardize a thing. Your people won't notice us. We're trained. We're professional. Look, I can accept the idea of Ken working with the students and Peter can... Uh, 
Patrick can monitor the support staff. But to spy on the academic staff, I just don't know about that, Bryce. Uh, with all due respect, <laughs> and aside from anything else, you uh, just can't pass yourself off as an academic. Is there a badge for trying? Frankly, I could have been an academic. I did have two choices. Then I settled for free enterprise. And yet, you know, there's a part of me that still yearns for the groves of academe. It's a tough decision. It could have gone either way. Which way did it go, as a matter of interest? I'll tell you what. An ex-student of mine, Alan Goodwin, a lecturer in 19th century English literature in New Zealand, is in Africa at the moment. Why don't you, for a short time, until we run this league to ground, why don't you be him here on a short study tour? Sounds fine. Anyone like a liqueur? I'm having a galliano. Yes, yes, I will. I'll have a cognac, thanks, Bryce. I'll have a beer. In a very expensive glass. Okay. The plan is bold, but simple. Pat, are you listening to this? Uh, it won't work. It's a commando raid. Here we go. We're going in behind enemy lines. Now, Pat, you've always wanted to play a bigger part in the operations. Well, now you're going to. But there's no room for mistakes. It's a very finely tuned plan. Oh, sorry. And if anything goes wrong, there'll be no one there to bail you out. Um, what exactly is the plan? We are all being put into the university system. Ask him what he's being put in as. What are you being put in as? Visiting English lecturer. It's a commander, Red Pat. They'll never know what hit him. Don't be silly, Ken. <laughs> Ah, uh, there's a magic about this place, isn't it? Is there? It's humbling when you think of some of the great people that have been in these buildings. Yeah, I feel very humble, yeah. Now, all I ask from you two is that you remember your parts, that we remain a team with a sense of unity and a sense of dignity. Listen, feel the language. The whole of the old yes. Western civilization in a 15 minute mime show. Jane! 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 Have you got a moment? Goodwin is downstairs. Uh, show him up and we'll uh, introduce him around. Of course. Dr. Alan Goodwin. Yes. Oh. Which one of them is he? The one with the woman. He's downstairs. Bring him up straight away. Fewer people he speaks to, the better. I see Carlton won again on Saturday. <laughs> now I'm only new in myself. I found the Gibson building. I spent the morning yesterday looking for it over the other side of the union. Yes. Why don't we suggest to the English department that they change the paper the day before the exam? Don't bother me with 11th hour schemes, Pat. I'm trying to tune my psyche into the frequency of this place. Yes, but it would save a lot of effort, wouldn't it? Pat, we're not here as a labour-saving device. We're here to uncover a fraud. I'm investigating the academic staff, Ken is doing the student arena, and you should be tying up the secretarial support personnel. You know what that means, don't you? Field work, Pat. A chance to spread your wings. A lot of photocopying is what it means. A lot of photocopying and typing. Oh, and a spot of tea-making to add interest. Look, I'm sorry about that, Pat, but that's just the way it is. I mean, if Ken or I did those jobs, would only arouse suspicion. God knows, Ken and I are very strong feminists. All of which means I'm photocopying. Now, aren't they going to wonder who I am? Look, trust me, Pat. The planning on this one is faultless. Now, Daniels and his secretary have been briefed. All you have to do is front up. Now, look casually to your left. Now, don't stare. Gene is placing Ken into the system as we speak. Everything is in place. It's watertight. Frankly, I'm feeling very confident about this. I might go home. <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, ladies, uh, if I may, we are about to have a stranger walk among us. Coercion? Is an ex-student of mine. He's a brilliant young mind. Nepotism? Uh, 
Dr. Alan Goodwin. Uh, you won't have met him before, but I'm sure you'll all be familiar with his work. Absolutely. Now, yeah. let me just say that he's here only very briefly, on a bit of a sabbatical. Oh, but it's a takeover. Yes. yes. Excuse me, everybody. Uh, may I introduce Dr. Alan Goodwin, who's going to be with the department for a short time? Uh, I you were having lunch with yesterday. Welcome to the trenches, Alan. I'm Dennis, incidentally. Simone, Alan. Simone. Good day, Simone. Alan! How delightful to see you again. Yeah. Can we have a short chat? Yes, of course. How are Margaret and the kids? Who? Being an idiot is like riding a bike. Once you've learned how to do it, you never forget. I think the best place for that's in a bin, don't you, boy? Carry on, carry on. Oh, I am sorry. I literally went straight downstairs and there he was, standing in the courtyard talking to a woman. Yes, well, it's happened now. The point is, what are we going to do about it? Oh, I'm sorry, really, I am. Oh, look, don't blame yourself, Jean. That no, wasn't your fault. Now, Thank you. I suggest we don't try to apportion the blame here. I agree. Fair enough. Because this wasn't my idea. It wasn't mine either. Well, let's not apportion the blame. It was Bryce's fault. I was against it. I knew it wouldn't work. Who's she? That's Pat. Oh, hi, I'm Pat. Look, everything's going to be all right. We're all positioned somewhere within the university system. It's fine. Now, all we've got to do is wait for the exam questions to leak. Well, we can't wait for long if it means passing this man off as a PhD in English literature. Oh, it's no problem. He's an absolute master of disguise. Hmm. Who wrote Gray's Elegy? Never heard of it. You don't have to have heard of it, Ken. All it is is a poem called Gray's Elegy. Who wrote it? I don't know anything about poetry. You don't have to. Just think. Listen. Who wrote Gray's Elegy? Pat, I'll tell you I don't know some of these because I bloody well don't know it. There are things I do know. It just doesn't happen to be one of them. Ken, you see that big neon sign down there? Yeah. What's it say? Hopwood's Hardware. Right. Who owns it? Mr. Hopwood. Right. Mr. Hopwood owns Hopwood's Hardware. Who wrote Gray's Elegy? Oh, Mr. Hopwood. Dear God, that Milton were alive at this hour. You absolute bastard, Ken. That's it, I'm resigning. You can tell Bryce. And I want the 400 bucks back I gave you for the rent yesterday, thank you. I'll give it to you tomorrow afternoon. How can you? You don't have it. You bet it on a horse. Prove it. I have the betting slip. <laughs> right, Dr. Goodwin. She's blackmailed back. Dr. Goodwin, who wrote Gray's Elegy? Gray. Lyle's Euphoes. Lyle. Spencer's Fairy Queen. Spencer. Maybe it'll work. Of course it will. Just out of interest, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress? Right. Right. I'm sorry, are you talking to me? I am. I'm sure you all have classes to attend. I'm afraid you have the wrong person. I am Dr. Alan Goodwin. You're not, I'm afraid. All right, Pat, that's it. No more field work. I don't give a second chance. You simply can't handle pressure. Right. Now listen, Pat. Fact number one, this entire operation depended on security. A security you have chosen to compromise. Fact number two, Bryce no longer exists. He is a dream, a vague memory. A Dr. Alan Goodwin has taken his place. He's taken Ken's as well. What are you talking about? There's uh, been a bit of a stuff up. Ken is now Goodwin. He's talking to the staff at the moment. That's not funny, Pat. It is a bit. It's also true, I'm afraid. I see. Could you tell Ken the next time you see him, please, that he's sacked? I will. In the meantime, you are now a mature age student. That's your ID. Uh, you'll notice in the photo that you're not wearing the gown. Two parts to the paper. Part A and part B. Are you with me? I think I can cope with that, yeah. Part A is compulsory, although, of course, it may consist of optional elements, and part B consists of the optional questions themselves, which the examinees are obliged to select three. So it's more or less compulsory to do three of the optionals. It is necessary to answer five questions, two from part A, which consists of two questions, and to that extent they're both compulsory, and three from part B, which consists of something like eight questions, and to that extent the part B section is the compulsory section, no, the optional section. But you have to do the optional section. 
Yes. Who sets the questions? <laughs> well, you know who he is, don't you? This new tutor. You know what they're doing. In what sense, Travis? Exactly what happened in El Salvador. <laughs> I must admit that is a perspective that I haven't quite seen myself. You sent in advisors, and what they're actually doing is destabilizing. The huh. politics of paranoia. You are not paranoid, of course. I'm not paranoid. Refusing to give a paper at a conference in case someone finds out what you know is not the act of a well-adjusted, rational being. Like yourself, obviously. Simone, I have never worked in a department so imperiled by ideas. Hmm? If you can't fight Marxist criticism in the 19th century novel, you have to fight it in 20th century drama. That's the politics of paranoia. No, that's the paranoia of politics. Nice distinction, Dennis. It's not a distinction, it's a bum. Well, let's just call it a bum's distinction, shall we? Travis, you're overreacting to this tutor business. There's a reason the guy's here. There's a reason for everything, Travis. He's here to replace someone, Den. Good. Hmm? I want to know whose job he's after and who sent him. In such cases, it may well be that the process of consultation is more detailed or requires a greater input from the senior staff. But even in such cases, and uh, I can't think of any in recent times, the head of the department will always frame, or at least supervise, the framing of the Part A question, except in very unusual circumstances. Like what? I can't think of any. But I can conceive of circumstances that could be considered unusual. Who's the head of the department? I am. So you set the part A question? Yes. Can we open a window? Morning. There you are. Is this all there is? That's all I could find. You've looked up every single reference to Alan Goodwin. It doesn't have to be Dr. Alan Goodwin. He wasn't always doctor. That's every mention of Alan Goodwin. Dr. Alan Goodwin, Mr. Alan Goodwin, any Alan Goodwin. A Len with two L's, a Lan with one, Goodwin with an I, Goodwin with a Y, and the nesting instincts of Godwits. If your Dr. Goodwin has written anything for publication, it's on that list. Oh, my God. Towards a clearer understanding of sexuality in Jane Austen, Mansfield Park and repressed voyeurism. What kind of a fool are we dealing with here? So, the Part B questions are set by eight different people who don't see the part A question or the seven questions they each don't have a hand in. Theoretically, yes. Although that's not necessarily the way it's going to work in any given case. Of course not. Would anyone have seen the whole paper after it's been set, but before it goes away to be printed? Oh, yes, I should think so. Although, of course, the theoretical answer to that would have to be no. That's why the system's designed the way it is. Yes, but the real answer is yes, isn't it? Not necessarily. But it would appear more likely if you were a betting man. Because of the consultation. And the gossip and the eavesdropping. I don't know, the place leaks like a sieve. There's got to be some explanation. Peace, brother. Maintain your rage. Alan, um, what do you think of this? What is it? Um, a critical analysis of style in Brechtian theatre. Revisionist oh. crap. Is it? I thought it was very interesting. It was written by a moron. The possibility that it's interesting doesn't exist. Who wrote it? A moron. Finbar Garcia. Read Susan Sontag on Finbar Garcia. <laughs> what does she say? A moron. Why? Good question. One thing they're not prepared for. Because style is a bourgeois concept. And there's no such thing as style. Why is Marlowe Shakespeare? It's entirely possible that he is. Different ideology. Or possibly the same ideology, differently expressed. No, that would be stylistic difference. Isn't that a bourgeois concept? Well, it's your concept, not mine. Right. The point is, it doesn't exist. You're not a Marxist, are you, Alan? No, I'm a Leo. Not that Brixtian theatre is relevant, anyway. It's like more relevant than Henry James and the Anglo-American middle class twerps. Oh, I see you've met Alan, have you? I must say, it's a joy to see someone of your generation with a passion for Jane Austen. You have a passion for Jane Austen? Well, I don't know about a passion, but... A profound interest. An interest, yeah. A profound interest. Yeah, I suppose so. I suppose when you think about it, it's pretty profound. Really? What are you now? Well, it breaks my heart to say it, but now I'm just a tired old cynic. It'll happen to you. Now, you might think it won't, but it will. You see, you change. 
You start off as you are now, full of fresh ideas, opposed to the boring old farts, demanding some new vision. Now, I don't know if you know the song, We Shall Overcome. Who did it? Well, we all did. An old generation of us. Overcome what? Well, exactly. And, of course, you know what the 60s were like. I wasn't born until 1966. Didn't the protesters stop the Vietnam War? Well, maybe. But you see, you get tired. You mellow. You can't go on believing forever. Believing what? My point exactly. Did you believe in anything before you mellowed into being a tired old cynic? Well, I suppose so. When I became a man, I threw away childish things. Might sound hard, but... Sounds like bullshit. You're angry. Now, that's great. You're young. You should be angry. I'm not angry. Oh, yes, you are. You mightn't think you're angry, but you are. Well, why am I angry? Because you've been challenged. You perceive a threat. You're role-playing. Am I? Yes, obviously. Now, you might decide to light a cigarette, look around, catch the eye of someone you know, change the subject, perhaps. Or pour a cup of coffee into my bag. Now, we're both angry. Is it about this guy? You're about the fifth person I've had to do this for. What's going on over there? Oh, oh, he's just a new member of staff. Seems like an interesting fellow, so I thought I'd uh, see what he's done. Excuse me, can I borrow that for a moment? Jane Austen, mostly. Sexuality, style and Jane Austen. Mansfield Park and repressed voyeurism. Austen and her world. Elliot and Austen. Austen and Elliot. Elliot, Austen and sexuality. Thanks. Who's that answer? Right. I don't know. <clears throat> who were the, uh, are the four who asked? I can't remember. Reference library. Yes, yes, he's an authority on aspects of Jane Austen. Yes, sexuality, style in Jane Austen. Aus he didn't say. Austen in her world. Yes, Elliot and Austen. Austen and Elliot. <laughs> Take away our forest. Take away our land. Kill the blacks. Mine uranium. Rape our women. But we will not care. For we have our balloons. These are tomorrow's leaders. Unless possibly I've got the address wrong. Yes? Good day. Are you all right? Yeah, can I borrow a book? What do I do? I just go and get one and bring it back, is that it? And then you check it out? <clears throat> Have you ever used the library before? Not the actual book part of it, no. Do you know how to use a catalogue? It's alphabetical, isn't it? Well, that part of it through there is, yes, subjects and authors. Then there's the fish catalogue over here. You've got a separate section for fish here, haven't they? Micro fish. You look the book up under its author or its subject. Now, what's the book about? No, I don't know. I haven't read it yet. Do you know the author's name? Yeah, Austen. Uh, somebody Austen. It was a woman. Jane Austen? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that'll do. Jane Austen, 820s, English Literature, third floor. If you have any trouble, come back. Right, uh... All right, Pope. Uh, presume not the God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. Now, what is Pope saying here? This is a question of agenda, isn't it? Isn't he saying that the agenda has to be changed in a Hegelian sense? Of course, if you want a decent example of this, you'll forget all about Pope, who's just another rhyming imperialist, and you will go to Brecht. Uh, how about Rupert Brooke, the rough male kiss of blankets? Yes, thank you. Alan, how are you getting on? Sitting in all right? Good, yeah, fine. Yes. Look, next Saturday, this staff barbecue, we normally foregather at my place for a drink or two beforehand. Love you to come. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. All work and no play. Mm, Alan? <laughs> found something then, have you? Yeah, I'd like these for a couple of nights, please. Oh, good. You found Jane Austen then. Yeah. My God, you've got some books in here, haven't you? Yes. Have you got your card there? Yep. Yeah. Quick learn Jane Austen reader for beginners. That's the one. It's a bit remedial, isn't it? In what sense? Well, that's simplistic rubbish. 
A lot of people are very grateful for a book like that. Dr. Alan Goodwin. Hmm. Can we have your undivided attention, please? What are you reading? Jane Austen. I'm trying to become an authority on Jane Austen by tomorrow afternoon. Jane Austen's easy. I'll fix you up on Jane Austen. How are you going to do that? I'll tell you all about her. Now, can we discuss these exam leaks, please? What do you know about Jane Austen? I've studied the woman. I'm sorry, we've got a bad line here. What do you know about her? Can we please discuss these exam links? Yes. Go ahead. Right. Now, what have we learned so far? Ken. Nothing. Nothing. Ken so far has discovered nothing. Pat? Nothing. Ken and Pat jointly together have discovered the grand total of nothing. And what have you discovered? What do you want to know about Jane Austen? You haven't discovered anything, have you? And don't be impertinent, Pat. That's no way to behave. You wouldn't behave like that at home. Look, how the hell would I discover anything? I'm on the bloody outside. You two are on the staff. I don't have access to how the system works or who's doing what. You two are on the staff, so how would I know anything? Well, so far, I have met a Mr. Carmichael and a Mr. Travis. Travis is harmless. No, he isn't. I went to one of his tutorials today. He spoke absolute nonsense the whole time. Absolute nonsense. What about? Class ideologies, bourgeois values, nothing to do with the questions at all. Didn't want to know about the exams. Doesn't hold with exams, apparently. Why not? Bourgeois. Bourgeois, apparently. How'd you get his degree? He won it in a raffle. Hmm. Which exams were they asking about? These, these next ones? Yes. Didn't want to discuss it. What was he being asked to discuss? Something on Pope. What from Pope? Essay on man. Do you remember what it was from Essay on Man? Listen, what the hell is this? What bit of what poem from what tutorial? Let's not get too silly here, Pat. Let's not lose touch with the basics here. Were they all asking about the same passage? No, not all. Well, what, 50% of them? No, about 80%. And you don't remember what the passage was? No, I don't. Would you recognise it if you read Essay on Man? Yes, probably. Why don't you do that, Bryce? Why? Because, because it... Go on. Because if that passage is on the exam paper and they know about it, then it's leaked already. Now, if you can buy that paper from those students, we'll know who leaked it. Oh, look, I know that. I'm not a complete idiot. In what sense aren't you a complete idiot, Bryce? Mm -hmm. Right. Good morning. Now, what is it? You got a question on Pope in the exam? And in what sense? In a sense of having a question on Pope in the exam. What sort of question? Any sort of question. I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, there's a question that refers overtly to Pope as such. No, in that sense, I would have to say no. There's nothing on Pope as such. Not per se. Not qua Pope. How about, know then thyself, presume not God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. And so on. Essay on man. Oh, yes, I see what you mean. Yeah. Isn't that Pope? Yes, it is. Yeah. And isn't it in the exam? Yes, but it isn't attributed. It's the passage on critical analysis. It's the big, major, all-important, compulsory Part A question, isn't it? Hmm. Well, it's leaked. Uh, 150 copies on the yellow, please. Right. I'm uh, Dennis, incidentally. Hi, Pat. Uh, you're new here. Just a temporary. Nice, nice. I, uh, listen, Pat, I wonder if you could do me a small favour. The university runs a little literary magazine called Meaning and Text, which is currently short to the tune of one editor. Now, a very good friend of mine, Dr. Alan Goodwin, is here for a brief stay, and I happen to think that he would make an excellent editor. Yeah, he seems very nice. A delightful chap, uh, one of nature's gentlemen. Um, I'd like to put his name up to the selection committee, uh, uh, but I find that I'm a little bit vague on his personal details. You'd like me to do some checking up for you? Discreetly. Of course. Thank you. Super, Pat. Uh, welcome aboard. Uh, and, um, uh, Love the skirt. Ah, Alan, um, could I have a minute? Yeah. Have you got a minute? Yeah, go for your life. Good. I won't keep you long. My uh, Jane Austen tutorial on Thursday, Pride and Prejudice. Love you to come. Sit in, fill a few questions. Busman's holiday. I'm normally a bit buggered on a Thursday. Ah. Yes, well, look, doesn't have to be thirsty. We can change it to suit. I've had a word with Ian Daniels, and he said that uh, he might even come himself. 
Just let me know a time, Alan, and uh, we'll, we'll put you in your hands what it is to be wanted. Hmm? <clears throat> What's it about again, this thing? Hmm? The tutorial? Yeah. Uh, Pride and Prejudice. Bryce? Bryce, you've got about 11 hours to fill me in on Jane Austen. Shh. This is it, son. This is your big chance. I currently know nothing. I'm soon, in 11 hours, I've got to know everything. Ken, you seem agitated. You bet I'm You have some sort of problem. I want to hear all about it, really, I do, next week. Now I want to hear complete silence. I'm preparing a piece on Tennyson. I'm talking to students about Jane Austen tomorrow. I'm presenting a piece on Tennyson tomorrow. Mine's at 10.30 in the bloody morning. Ah, sorry, mine's at 9.45. Face facts, I can't help you. Can I help you? I doubt it. What do you have to know about? Jane Austen. I've got all these books out, but I haven't looked at any of them. She wrote a series of novels, a novel's a sort of story. I know what a novel is, Ken. On the good side, I've only got to talk about two of them. Which two? Pride and Prejudice. Oh, dear. Will you two please shut up? I can't say all this. I'd never remember it all. If Professor Daniels is there, he'll look after you. Yeah, I look forward to that. He'll have to. What if it's not there? Well, haven't you picked anything up? Well, only if you don't know what someone's talking about, you say in what sense. It's not a lot to go on, is it? A tutorial isn't all that long. You don't have to be an absolute expert. All you have to do is know enough to get by. But Pat, at the moment, I don't know a bloody thing. All the team talk in the world isn't going to do any good unless I get some facts down me. All right. Pride and prejudice. It's about pride and prejudice. Well, it has to be, doesn't it? If it's not, I want to know why. Will you two please shut up? Morning, Jane. Morning. Jane, I'm not going to be able to get to Carmichael's Austin tutorial this morning. Will you apologise? I wasn't able to go to Travis's yesterday, so I dare and go to Carmichael's today. <sighs> Make sure Goodwin doesn't go either. Time driveth onwards fast, and in a little while our lips are dumb. Let us alone. What is it that will last? All things are taken from us and become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. So, Bryce, what's our friend Tennyson saying? You know, I've been tossing that around in my head for the past 12 or so hours, and I think it's an allegory. I think it's allegorical. In what sense, Bryce? It's about art. It's about the artist as the speaker of his age. Would you like to elaborate on that a bit, Bryce? Well, you know, in a sense, the poem is demanding that we, the reader, recognise the importance of art and love in the modern world. Very interesting. I must admit I've never quite looked at it in that light before. Don't you think the poem's also about time? Sure. What do you think that Tennyson's saying about time? That there isn't enough of it. That time is a part of our life in the way we breathe. Ergo, poetry is a form of breathing. Very interesting. Perhaps you'd like to breathe a little more for us, Bryce. Can I interrupt? It's not exactly relevant, but, well, I, I read a passage on Pope last night and I was hoping we might discuss it. I think we should let uh, Bryce share more of his insights on Tennyson before we touch on Alexander Pope. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes, that's a very interesting point you raise, and I think it brings us closer to another of those intriguing little dilemmas which Austen seems, with that wonderful subtle mischief of hers, to be presenting to the arena time and time again. Whether she is fashioning uh, drama from morality or morality from drama, and I choose the word fashioning not without some care, in the end, isn't it the very fineness of what she does that so enchants us? Uh, don't we agree with Virginia Woolf when she says that of all the great writers, it is Austen who is the most difficult to catch in the act of greatness? Um, Alan, do you have any um, comments on the essentially stylistic elements of the prose? In what sense, Dennis? Well, I was thinking in Emma or in Mansfield Park, yes. In fact, more so in Mansfield Park, but in Northanger Abbey as well albeit in a less developed and markedly less internally satirical mode, there's always this sense of... 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 Of what, Dennis? Well, the sense 
ultimately of the extent to which wisdom and passion are governable by one another. Mm. Yeah, it's that sense. Yeah. In uh, Pride and Prejudice, the cynicism of Elizabeth's father has always seemed to me to be very impish and a wickedly ironical element. I don't know what you think about this, Alan. I don't know why I'm talking at all when we have you here. Uh, over to you. <clears throat> Pride and Prejudice is basically, when you boil it all down, about two things. Let's take them together. It's about pride and prejudice. Ah, yes, well, there you see, we have it. I once had a lecturer who said that pride is a form of snobbery and prejudice is snobbery. Snobbery and snobbery by Jane Austen. Hmm? <laughs> Didn't understand the first thing about it. No eye for the nuance, you see, Alan, none at all. No, a lot of them don't, Dennis. Goes right over their head, some of them. G'day. Hey, listen, uh, just as a matter of interest, uh, this Pope thing you keep asking about, I mean, what's going on here? I mean, you surely don't think they're going to ask the question on Pope, do you? And I don't even know any Pope. I haven't even looked at Pope. We'll see. What do you know that I don't? Of course there's a Pope question. We'll see. I've seen the paper, cowboy. You've seen the paper? Hey, come on, tired old cynic. You don't seriously believe that you can't buy exam papers. Oh, I've never heard of anything so naive in all my life. Yes, but how on earth did you get to see the paper? What do you want to? Sure. It'll cost you $400. I haven't got $400. Well, Robert, from your parents. It's all for them anyway. So uh, what do I do? Be here at 2 o'clock with the $400. And you give me the paper? I'll take the money and I'll tell you where you can pick up the paper. I don't deliver them around campus like a singing telegram. You uh, married, Alan? Huh? Uh, you're very welcome to bring your wife, you know, to any of these turnouts. No, I used to be, but, uh, well, you know. Sorry to hear it. Oh, I finished a long time ago. Any children? Yeah, one, a girl, Tracy. Great kid. It's nice. <clears throat> the only reason I ask, really, is that I... I've seen one of your articles recently, and, um... Oh, yeah? Any good, was it, Travis? It was, uh, very interesting, yes. On the sexuality and sense and sensibility. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember the night I was writing that, actually. Um, my brother wanted to go to the Greyhound. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, go on. Oh, and... In fact, in the biog at the top of this article, it said that um, you have five children. Yeah, well, that was from another marriage. Oh. And that one of them is a national junior champion rower. Yeah, that's Bevan. Yeah, he's worked very hard to get where he is. It's good to see a kid with an interest like that, don't you think? I think it said that this he was a she. Really? Good God. I don't spend nearly as much time with them as I'd like. And that you are happily married to a marine biologist. Yeah? Yeah. I think we should have a little chat, don't you, Travis? I thought I told you to remain where you were. We have been here for four hours. They're not going to show. Unless my guess is correct, the person who was making the drop is watching to make sure the coast is clear, in which case, Pat, you're currently jeopardizing the whole operation. Listen, you were told to be here by 9 p.m. It is now after midnight. If anything, they'd be more likely to show up earlier. I've been here since 8. There's no way anyone could have slipped by me. And there was nothing in the box when you arrived. Sorry? There was nothing in the box when you got here? Didn't look in the box. Why should I look in the box? Pat, we're watching for a person. I almost don't believe I heard that. Travis, I'll come to a little arrangement with you. I'll tell you who I really am and what I'm doing here. If you tell me who's leaking the exam papers. I don't just want a wild guess. 
This has to make some sort of sense. Common knowledge. Been doing it for donkey's years, apparently. Hmm. Shouldn't be too hard to make absolutely sure. Wait here. I've got one of the black market papers in my car. That's it, all right. There's a question on Pope, see? It's not the official paper, though, is it? No, it's the black market version. You know what I think? I can't imagine. Now, it's only a hunch, but this could be the work of a major crime network. There you go. All the photocopies are like that. There's a line across there on every copy I've seen. The photocopier in Daniel's office does exactly that. Now, you don't think he and Daniel's is up there at night throwing them off, do you? Hmm? To supplement the 70 or 80 grand that he's pulling down for running this place. It's Jean. It has to be. It isn't him, and look at the photocopy. It's his machine. Anyone will tell you that. A complete idiot could see that. I don't see that. How can you not see that? It's the single most obvious thing about the photocopy. It's a giant black mark, Bryce. It's Daniel's photocopier. Well, there must be other photocopies in the country that make that sort of mark. I wonder if the power of prayer isn't overrated. All right. Are you happy? Yep. It's Jean? Yes. And uh, that's all you need to know? Yeah. OK. Now, you are not Alan Goodwin. Who are you and why are you here? My name's Ken, and I'm here to find out who's leaking the exam questions. It's impossible! It's true, I'm afraid. It's been obvious to us for quite a while. She has been with me for 25 years. Yeah, she's abused the position rather badly. The typing has been done on her machine. This is quite shattering. And it was copied on the one out here. Yes, I can see that. Look, but, uh, if it's any consolation, Professor, I'm quite sure she'll be completely destroyed by the court case. It'll probably kill her. I'd better deal with this straight away. Jean, I think we'd better have a little chat. What's going to happen to her? Can you believe that, fool? The changing role of the Commodore in the Victorian novel. Jean Fitzgerald, mm. nothing's going to happen to her. Can't people go to prison for things like that? This is an office, Ken. It's an office in a university. It has nothing to do with the outside world. Hmm? Daniels won't do anything. Jean's been with him for years. She knows the place better than he does. People come to an arrangement. Hmm? It's consensus politics, Ken. Nothing changes by general agreement. They'll come to an arrangement. Jean, ring Harper and cancel lunch. Alan, uh, a word in your ear. <clears throat> Have you got a minute? Yeah. Ah, oh, look, it's an awful presumption on my part, and I don't quite know how to tell you this, but, uh, well, I've nominated you for the position of editor of Meaning and Text. Meaning and Text? Hmm. You can withdraw if you wish, or under no compunction whatsoever. I'll withdraw. To, uh, pardon? I'll withdraw. That's... Ah, yes, well, actually, uh, no, you can't withdraw. Uh, we've done a bit of a job on the left, and you're in. We just have to avoid the charge that it's rigged. Which it is. Oh, absolutely. But don't worry, the left did it last time. It's our turn. Now, the proprietors have to be observed. The selection panel invite all nominees to present a brief paper on an area of special interest. And I have suggested that you might be willing to present your compelling views on pride and prejudice. And how long would I have to present my compelling mm, views? Uh, well, only an hour, I'm afraid. Uh, I can try and squeeze a little no, more No, I think an hour would be, it'd be fine. Mm. So you'll do it? Well, I more or less have to, don't I? You're a brick. Pardon? <coughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> Our speaker today is a man I know many of you are anxious to hear. His essays on Jane Austen are rapidly becoming something of a legend. He is a respected speaker in his own right. I speak, of course, of Dr. Alan Goodwin, who will now present a brief paper on Pride and Prejudice. Dr. Alan Goodwin. I thank Dr. Carmichael for his kind words. Pride and Prejudice. 
in a sense. There's only so much you can say about it, really. It was written, as you may know, by Jane Austen, who wrote principally in the period between about breakfast and afternoon tea. <laughs> it is about pride and prejudice. Or is it about something else? Can it be about something else? In my opinion, and I use the term advisedly here, it is about pride and prejudice. <laughs>